All right, what's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades, and welcome back to another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. If you tuned in last week, we had a pretty good list. Pretty much all setups paid at some point. We had GDX, DVN, and also CCL. GDX and Gold had an insane run for the rest of the week. DVN and energy sector in general did very well. And CCL had a nice pop into Friday, but it kind of fell short of our 17s price target. So definitely still keep CCL on watch over some weeks or months. Still could have some more potential to the upside. We also closed the rest of the TLT I was talking about last week. Closed one half at 24% and closed the rest on Monday, I believe at around 55%. Treasuries did pretty good, starting to bounce as yields go down, kind of lining back up with the stock market because I feel like bonds and equities kind of had a divergence for a little bit. Stocks making new all-time highs, bonds going lower, kind of struggling to take off. But TLT made it to the upper channel line that we were looking for and now could see a little bit of resistance. So hopefully we have a repeat of last week. Hopefully we have some good setups for you this week. We do have some data, some big data actually this week. We do have the CPI coming out and that's going to be on Tuesday, March 12th. You can see we have nothing scheduled Monday. So CPI is our next data set going to be on Tuesday. CPI is always straightforward. We just want to see that continued trend lower. So we know that the Fed is done hiking rates, maybe even looking to cut soon. After hearing so much talk about higher for longer, people are expecting rate cuts going into 2024, maybe sometime towards the end of the year. Some expecting them in March, some expecting them in May. We'll have to see. As long as the Fed is data dependent, traders, investors are also data dependent. And then Thursday, we do have retail sales and also the producer side of inflation. We're going to look at the producer price index. Two big inflation gauges this week. It's going to be CPI on Tuesday, PPI on Thursday. And then Friday, most important is going to be the consumer sentiment at 10 a.m. This always brings mid-session volatility. You're going to want to pay attention to this. So that's for the economic data. Most important is going to be CPI. Second most important is going to be the PPI. Also consumer sentiment and U.S. retail sales. And on to the seasonality for this week. Last week, we did average somewhat of a little pullback the last 20 years. I think about 11 out of 9 trades would have been a winner if you went short last week, 20 years in a row. You would have had about a 55% chance to win to the downside. And we kind of did get a little bit of a pullback, but I would say it was mostly choppy. We can see the swing starting to get a little bit bigger. Friday, especially for tech, we had a big pullback in semis. We might even go into that later. Big engulfing bearish bars on the semi indexes on the semi ETFs on Nvidia, AMD, a bunch of stuff. And that really brought some pressure to tech in general. And we also had Google and Apple up on Friday, which is very strange. We had the market down with Google and Apple up, obviously because they've been laggers and you kind of seen that capital rotation back into Google and Apple. It kind of makes you wonder if Apple is a safety play of sorts because it's going up while the market's going down. But Apple did kind of sell off into the close as well. And that kind of brought the Nasdaq down with it because Apple, I would say, was probably the only thing holding up the market in general, if you have semi selling off, which has been most of our rally and you have Apple going up, Apple's kind of acting as some cushion. And then when Apple goes down, you're going to see semis and Apple going down at the same time. It's going to bring a lot more pressure. And we saw that going into the close on Friday. So last week was mixed. I would say we kind of followed the seasonality a little bit. There was a little bit of downside, not like making a new low, kind of like what you see right here. We didn't make a new low or anything, but we did kind of get a little bit of bearish seasonality, I guess. Just not to the exact graph here or followed the exact pattern to the downside. But for this week coming up, you can see we're kind of mixed again. We have winning trades at 50% for the last 20 years. This is the 20 year data set. You can see average profit was about 0.13%. So not a big move by any means. And we have gains and losses. 10 out of 10. So you got 10 gains, 10 losses the last 20 years, giving you 50% winning trades to the upside. You can see this little back test here is longs and the average move is up. If you went long this period next week or this week coming up from March 11th to the 15th, you would have won on about 50% of them, but still came out with a summarized profit of 2% over 20 years. So this period, not exactly the most bullish, not exactly the most bearish either. You can see max drawdown was at 3% at one point. So it doesn't matter what time period you're looking at, you're likely going to see some type of big drawdown. You know, if you're looking at 20 years of data, every single year is different. Market conditions change. This could be a drawdown from a bear market for all we know. But like I said, overall, if you went long the last 20 years here, 50% of them won and you would have came out with an average profit of 0.13% and a summarized profit of 2%. So basically the winners made up for the losers. But that's the average move for this week. 
slight bullish tilt, nothing crazy. You can see we're kind of getting in a range here, nothing really big impulsively. And we don't really get that big impulsive move towards the end of March here for this 20 year data set. If we go down to 10 years for the most recent years, you can see the vibe kind of changes a little bit. This is back testing short trades and you only have 40% winning to the downside the last 10 years. So you got four gains, six losses. If you went short this period, the last 10 years, but you can see it kind of does leg down again towards the end of the month. And then once the end of the month comes around, that's when we kind of get a big bounce and we see that big bounce on the 20 year data set and the 10 year data set. So maybe this period, we could be a little bit careful for a market pullback. But like I said, this is just for recent years. This is only 10 years of data. The other one we're looking at is 20 years worth of data. And on the 20 year data set, it's a little bit more calm, a little bit more collected, a little bit of chop, kind of like a base being made before trying to make a leg higher going into March and April. April. So that's for seasonality kind of mixed this week. Like I said, 50% have been winning trades if you went long the last 20 years in this exact period. But otherwise, you know, just maybe look for a slight bullish tilt. Not exactly sure how the data is going to come in. Nobody really knows. Economic data is very random. But we do have CPI, PPI, and also consumer sentiment. And on to the setups for this week, we do have three. I got GM, FCX, and also Uber. So GM here, we've had a pretty solid uptrend. You got a test one, a test two, and then a test three bounce. I'm guessing this is from our earnings gap up right here, kind of consolidated, and then ran some more. But now we're starting to test below that trend line. So I'm kind of looking for a short-term flush here. Obviously, the max I could see if it wants to flush lower, probably be that 3740 or so. That's this little gap base right here if we add on to the moving averages we're starting to close a little bit under the 21 and the 9 it probably will need to have a more obvious close under this 9 and 21 combo to flush but we are starting to get a little bit of evidence that it's, it's starting to give up a little bit especially on the 9 and 21 combo maybe this is the last higher low it's going to try to make we kind of do have it breaking this uptrend here it kind of came up for a back test and closed back below the trend line as you can see this is the close right here this is just briefly under that close. If we went to the 15 minute, we are closed under that trend line as well. And also, this is not the most bullish candle. This is kind of like a drop base drop potential setup. This is the ideal candle you would look for in a base to start heading lower, especially with this upper shadow wick on Friday's close. So pay attention to that. But like I said, if you want a more obvious signal, wait for an obvious close under that one day nine and 21 EMA combo. If it starts closing under the 21, that short-term trend could shift. You also have a negative KDJ here. Obviously, this has been crossed over probably the last four or five sessions. So it's a little bit of a late signal looking at it now, but this is negative. So the momentum is to the downside just a little bit the last four sessions, according to the KDJ and also starting to break under that trend, of course. So GM, I'm looking at puts on this. Obviously, you have lots of time until earnings. You got 44 days until they report. So maybe some longer dated puts on this, uh, at least April expiration minimum. April's starting to kind of cut it close though. I think the contracts are for 415 for the monthlies. So you got about 35 days from now. But as long as it's over 30 days, I would say it's a good swing contract. You can hold it overnight. Once it starts getting down to two weeks, that's when theta really starts to kick in and you really want it to be in the money at that point. That way you don't have to deal with any theta risk and your deltas will make up for it. So that's for GM looking at puts max downside. I could see is that 3740. I would have to see how it reacts to 3740 if it can get down there or at least the general area, maybe 38 even as a psychological level. But before I started looking for that whole gap to fill, I would have to see it start closing inside the gap just a little bit, or at least closing under that 3740. And that could fill this little earnings gap or whatever this event was right here. I'm guessing it was earnings. If it could start closing under that, you could start getting inside this gap eventually. But take it one level, one step at a time. 3740 is a good overall. And then you might have to go down to the shorter term time frames to find the short term price targets like for day trades, little scalps, stuff like that. But this 3740 is good for a more higher time frame, medium term price target over some time, maybe over a couple weeks, over a month or something. Keep your expectations low. And then once your price target hits, it feels that much better because you can't really expect much from the market. It is kind of random. So that's for GM looking at potential longer data puts, 30 plus days expiration minimum, but it looks pretty good at breaking trend here. Just look for that 3742 hit eventually. All right, next we're going on to Uber. This is actually another potential short setup or for puts. You can see it's starting to break down this little short term uptrend it was trying to form. We have a test one, a test two, nice little test three bounce led to a small little impulse move up into 8186, which is big resistance. We actually took puts at this 80 area. 
somewhere around it. And I think we sold on this day right here, this little Tuesday. And good thing we did because it actually bounced. So we would have been stuck in a range. And I think we made 35% on Uber. You'd probably have to go to the Xtrades app and look. I think it was like 35% or something, but you'll see my entry and exit on that. I feel like this impulse candle and this gap up was just too big. Just kind of had that what goes up must come down kind of mentality. I had a feeling it would try to pull back for a little bit. And it did for two days. Nice little dump. Made 35% and ran back up. Held the moving averages too. You can see this 9 to 21 combo is still holding. So the uptrend is still somewhat intact. But we are watching this short-term uptrend starting to break a little bit. And you also have a multi-top potential. So 81, 86, you got a short-term rejection here. Short-term rejection here. Friday, short-term rejection again. So this is not a confirmed triple top or anything. If this top pattern was to confirm, I would say we need to take out either this 74, 31 that would confirm a top pattern. Maybe this little area right here at 75.88. If we can start clearing under that, that could confirm a top pattern. With top patterns like a double top or a triple top, a lot of people make a mistake to short directly at the resistance when really it's not confirmed yet. The top pattern gets confirmed once it takes out the neckline or the support of the structure. So in a double top and a triple top, you always have a big resistance level and a support as well. You want to wait for that support or neckline to get taken out and that would confirm your pattern. So you want to see it do something like this, kind of break it, back test, and then head down. Maybe just take out the structure low. That would confirm into the gap as well. And that would give you a confirmed pattern. Likely the most obvious trade for any type of topping pattern would probably be once it starts getting inside the gap and you can short down into that. But sometimes with short-term options or really anything, you want to try to find it at a decent, you know, risk to reward. And sometimes, you know, at the resistance is the best spot, even though this pattern is not confirmed yet. It's not a confirmed triple top. It's not a confirmed double top. It's still some type of resistance you can go off of and you just keep your stop briefly above the high. But lots of times you can go short, like directly at the resistance. It'll pull back just a little bit and then it'll try to break out. But one thing we do have in our favor here, we are breaking that short term uptrend line. So the fact that it's breaking this little uptrend gives me reason to believe this is a failed ascending triangle. So an ascending triangle is a bullish pattern. It makes higher lows. It has flat top resistance. And on an ascending triangle for a bullish position, usually you'd be looking for a big breakout, like a blow off top. But you can see it failed here, broke the uptrend line, and we have three points of resistance. So that's why I feel pretty good about looking for a short-term pullback, at least into 75.88. So that's 75.88 and also that's 74.31. Those are two potential support areas. You would need to be careful of those if it does pull back into those. And like I was saying at the beginning of looking at this, we are still kind of holding that 9 and 21 EMA combo. We have a brief close under the 9, but not a close under the 21 yet. It would probably need to break under that 21 to really confirm a trend break. So that's why you may want to be a little bit conservative with your price targets on this, just because we're still holding that 9 and 21 EMA combo. Use that 75.88 and the gap support as well at the 74.31, that little gap area. That's probably your max downside for right now. Until it starts closing under that 9 and 21, then you could probably start shooting for that gap. So that's for Uber, looking at puts. Probably still April monthlies minimum, 30 plus days. I mean, they're about 35 days away. So as long as it's not, you know, at two weeks expiration, it's not as bad. I would stick to 30 plus days for any fresh position. If you're already in, that's one thing. And you only have two weeks left and you're up a little bit, or maybe you're down a little bit. That's one thing because you already entered. But if you're looking for something fresh, I would definitely stick with 30 plus days. All right. And last but not least for our individual tickers, we're going over FCX real quick. We actually had this in the list a couple of weeks ago. It was looking pretty good for a breakout. If you drew the trend line like this, this is what we were looking at right here. We had this little pop out or maybe it was this one and end up falling back in and coming out and going back out and just kind of messing around. So that didn't work out the last time we looked at it. But now that we have a more clear trend line here, we have a test one, a test two, test three rejection, four, five, a bunch of rejections right here. This is obvious. This is now a potential breakout. Not even potential, this is a breakout. You had a confirmed breakout here on this little 4% day up to 40. Likely due to the DXY going lower, US dollar. Maybe the copper markets went up. I know for sure gold went up. And they do have a little bit of stake in gold as well as copper, but their majority business is copper. So it's copper and gold. So it's good when the gold market goes up for FCX as well as copper. You want to see both going up. And likely that is due to DXY going lower when you see general metals go up all at the same time. So we probably will want to see that continued trend on DXY down, kind of like it's been doing last week to make the GLD go up or, you know, the gold futures, just gold in general, spot gold. It has been going higher in the DXY 
why it's been going lower. You want to see that continued trend really for any metals. So FCX, I'm looking at calls. This is a little bit more solid than the last time we were looking at it. We have a very solid breakout, kind of are getting over this little double bottom resistance right here as well. It probably will need to stay over that 39.75. We do have a little bit of resistance at 41 flat or 40.99, which is this little high right here. So this little structure right here could be an issue. But overall, I feel like it could get up to that supply target over time. If you buy time on your contracts, could trade up to that supply. It's going to be at the 42s, 4250 or so. So these little structures are kind of a mess, I guess you could say, because you got a little rejection structure right here that led to this. You got chop and rejections right here that led to this leg lower. So we will need to kind of trade through this little choppy area to get up to supply overall. We are starting to trend over the moving averages. You can see we're over the 50, we're over the 200, we're over the 9 and the 21. And I think the last time we were looking at it, we weren't really above the 921 and the 50 and the 200 as much as we are right now. So we do have a more clear pop over all the moving averages compared to last time when we just had this little pop right here. We also have a positive KDJ here. So that's starting to curl up from the last two sessions. That's a good sign for momentum. And overall, it just looks pretty good for, you know, bounce a little retrace back up to supply. And that supply zone originates from right here. You can see it's a drop base drop. So something happened in this area to lead to this drop. And when it came back up and tested it right here, we had another drop again. So this supply is obvious. This is something the price is respecting. And that's why it's probably the maximum area you could look up to overall because you don't know how it's going to react once it gets up there. So that's for FCX. Looking at calls, just make sure it's staying over your 9 and 21 EMA combo. Make sure it's staying over the 50 or the 200 as well. As long as it's over all your moving averages, I would say the uptrend is pretty good. And your chance to go higher is a little bit raised as long as you're over all those moving averages. And to give it time to work through this chop area, if this does become an issue at the 41s and the 42s as well, go with April expiration minimum, probably, you know, the 415s. It gives you 35 days. It's above 30 days and it gives you time to think and if it does decide to pull back i feel like a 30-day expiration pullback wouldn't be as bad on your premiums if you want to go further out that works too go with may or something give you lots of time to work back up to supply but i feel like overall this little supply would be a good price target overall all right and on to the indexes the first we'll go over is the spire the s p 500 last friday we were focused on this little impulse candle obviously we had no confirmation or anything of downside or really a good entry for upside or anything other than this little impulse breakout so i really didn't like anything right here the only thing you really had to go off was potential pullback for seasonality and you see we did get that on tuesday we had a pullback of one percent Closed down 1%, came down into these little structure lows right here at the 504s, close to the gap support, but not quite. And then eventually we bounced back up and made a new high, etc. came back down again on Friday. So like I said, when we were going over the seasonality, it was very mixed. We had some bear seasonality, but we had to buy our show back up and then bear seasonality again on Friday once all the semis pulled back. And I feel like the semis brought down the market very heavily. And our main focus pretty much the past month or two, really past couple of weeks, is this 9 and 21 EMA combo. You're probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but you definitely want to pay attention to it and improved it again. We pulled back into the 9 and 21 combo combo right here and it ripped back up two days in a row uh, on this Tuesday. So if you bought the dip in the 9 and 21 combo as every single time it pulled it into it, you would have made some money these past two days right here. Even, you know, a two day swing would have made you some money as well just by buying off the 9 and 21 EMA combo. So nothing has changed on that front. We still are trending over that 9 and 21 EMA combo as usual as we have been for months now, which is just crazy because it's like the it's like the EMAs just never end. The higher lows are just forever, right? I mean, we've been adding these higher lows basically since the beginning of 2024, even before that. So towards the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024, we just keep making higher lows, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs. We could be getting a little bit of a structure shift after Friday's close. It depends on the semis, I think. So if the semis pull back more and violently and keep following through with those bearish engulfing bars they made, they could bring the market down pretty heavily. It just depends. Overall, the SPY and the QQQ are still trading over their 9 and 21 EMA combos. So you really don't want to exactly go short into them. And like I said, it's good to use trend lines and stuff as well for higher lows. So if you want to do that, you can do that as well. We got this trend line right here. So we have from October lows, you got a test one, a test two, test three. And there's also this way of drawing it, test one, test two, test three, four, five. So you can use this one as well. The other was just an addition that goes from this low to this little low right here. So you can see the point one. 0.2 and that extends out this way and that's just in case 
the spy does want to pull into that second part and still hold it up, you just want to be sure, right? Because if we got rid of this and let's say it started closing under this just briefly, it could just go back over it just because we didn't have the trend line draw correctly. So it's good to have both of those available if you can. You have your regular single, which has been holding overall. We really haven't had a crazy close under it. Had a brief break under it right here. But if you add that second, which goes from this low to this little higher low right here that led to that Nvidia earnings gap up, that would be good. Because once it gets under both of those, it's going to be really obvious that something is shifting. So you probably see a break, back test, then go lower. So your 9 and 21 combo on the one day or trend lines, best way to use your trend. Both of them worked last week. So if you had your trend line drawn out or if you had your 9 and 21 combos up, you would have been able to identify a potential higher low. You could have taken a stab at some calls down here and made a little two day swing to the upside before Friday. So just keep it simple, guys. I mean, that's just how the market's working right now. It's the most simple way to read a trend. The most simple way even to know not to short or be careful shorting goes really small if you're really going to try to call the top because this is really just holding very well. Doesn't matter what you look at. 9 to 21 combo, trend line, it's all holding the same. So I would just keep tracking those EMAs and that trend line, keep trying to buy dips off it till it stops working. Wait for a trend shift to the downside, a little close under it to go short. You could mark some horizontal levels as well. So we do have a short term 51420. We do have a pretty big rejection level from 5.18.22 on Friday. Just from this one bar, it made it obvious that something happened up here to lead to selling. We also have a structure right here at 5.04.75 and then gap low at 5.03.02. So if you want to mark those, you could do that as well. You can even get rid of the trend lines here for a sec so it's more clear. That's one way to mark your levels. So this is kind of your trading range. If it doesn't want to pull back, you probably start looking for support around the 504s, as long as it's still holding over your 9 to 21 combo, still holding over your trend lines. This is a pretty good area to kind of scalp off of, even for day trades. You don't have to buy swings all the way up here if you don't want to, because we are kind of getting at a frothy level. So you want to be careful doing that. I'm not buying any swings up here personally. The long I really liked was Apple last week, and I had some call debit spreads on those. I closed those on Friday on that big move up on Friday, made about 40 bucks on my challenge account, brought the challenge account back to $400 from our $300 starting point, kind of a little drawdown from SMH. So yeah, longs really suck up here. I mean, it's, it's tough to buy, but if you're using that nine and 21 combo, like I've been showing you, it has been working pretty well. So that's your levels for this week. You got 518.22, 514.20, and then potential supports at 504.75 to 503. Otherwise, nothing has changed. Like I've told you the past couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, nine and 21 combo still all holding the same. So got to be careful with that trend line I showed you drawn, still holding over those, making higher lows on that. No close under it just yet. So you can't get too bearish. All right. And on to market breadth. This is stocks above their 50 day moving average, actually S&P stocks, S&P 500 stocks above their 50 day moving average, which has actually been curling up despite the market going down on Friday. We actually had stocks above their 50 day go higher. So that kind of gives you a sign that the SPY pulling back was mostly probably a large cast, but you had a lot of lower tier names kind of in the S&P 500, maybe getting back over their 50 day moving average, which is interesting because that kind of just shows a little bit of a divergence between breadth and the market. Maybe that means it's widening out and that's a good thing. You got breadth going up uh, while the market pulls back. Maybe that means that the lower tier names kind of are providing support in the market. And we're not just seeing a rally from big techs, mega caps and stuff like that, because we do have a 35% concentration in the indexes. The top 10 names for market cap in these indexes is 35%. We haven't seen levels like that since the tech bubble in 2000s. So it's scary. And we want to see widening on breadth. We want to see lower tier names, small caps, mid caps, all going up as well, showing that it's not just the large mega cap tech stocks carrying the whole freaking market on its back. And that's kind of what we use the stocks above their 50 day for. And when we saw it going lower right here, we were kind of assuming that it was only mega caps carrying us because we had stocks above their 50 day, the majority going below their 50 EMA and going back lower. But we had the SPY still making all time highs and going higher. So this last pullback on stocks above their 50 day has been opposite to the SPY, which is a divergence. And that's kind of been making us think that we could see a pullback in the market because we don't have breadth agreeing with the SPY. So that's kind of what I've been showing the past couple of weeks, just uh, SPY versus F5 FI, which is the indicator. So we have breadth pulling back. This is the indicator we were just looking at, or this one right here. We have the orange, which is S5 FI, stocks above their 50 day, going lower, SPY going higher. And then right here, we had stocks above their 50 day and the index is kind 
kind of agreeing with each other. So once we got to this little bottom period, market was going up and also breadth was going up. So it was really just this month long divergence right here that didn't make any sense. And maybe that was because mega caps carried it, but you had the majority of lower tier names going lower right here. And then once breadth bottomed out right here, lower tier names came back up and you have mega caps also going up and that kind of made up for the difference. So that's probably the only conclusion I could come up with. Why are we seeing stocks above their 50 day going lower while the spy is going higher? That's probably the only conclusion I could come up with. We had large caps carrying, lower tier names going down. And then at this point right here, we had lower tier names plus mega caps also going up. And that's why you have breadth aligning with the SPX or the S&P 500 right here. So it's a good sign. It's, I mean, it's, it means the market's broadening out and it's not just mega caps carrying, but you still want to be cautious because you do have stocks above their 50 day, not making new highs. It's not getting back up to its peak out point right here. So this is a peak out point, peak out point right here. This last peak out point right here, aligned with the market pullback. This little peak out point, just a little short-term pullback, nothing crazy. We also had a peak out point right here. Stocks above their 50-day peaked out, market peaked out, pullback right here. Another peak out point right here. So once the stocks above their 50-day get up here, I'd definitely be a little bit more worried about a pullback. But as long as it's staying up and curled up right here, I don't feel too bearish about the market. And as long as the market's still holding over that 9 and 21 combo, I still feel pretty good about the market making higher lows, maybe just chopping out, not seeing any major volatility just yet. Maybe even needs to get inside this gap as well before starting to look too bearish. But we do not have stocks above their 50-day trending back lower with the market on Friday. So maybe we'll need to see breadth go lower and the market go lower at the same time to get a little bit more evidence that the market it could come down for right now breath is curling up market still curling up still holding over the moving averages we're not seeing any huge evidence of anything just yet i would say it's just evidence of broadening out lower tier names making up for mega caps when they have a bad day vice versa so everything's still in pretty good shape i would say for now breath is still curling up haven't seen a big drawdown in breadth and also the market just kind of had a little small red day here for the SPY, the QQQ, a little bit of a different story, but we'll go over that next. All right, and on to QQQ, which had a much more dramatic reversal on Friday. You can see we have a big bearish engulfing right here. This is all due to semis. We had AMD, NVIDIA, everything in the semi sector was pulling back as a whole. So you can see this is our original trend line here. We have a test one, a test two, a test three. We had a brief break under it, but then we got back over it. We have a test right here and another impulse move bounce. Briefly broke below it went back up. So this trend line's kind of been iffy. You probably will want to add an extra from October lows, but then go to this point right here. So this was the day before Nvidia earnings that led to this huge QQQ move 3% up. So definitely mark from this low to this little higher low right here. I would definitely keep that on watch. Do not try to short until it starts breaking under that. If it starts breaking under this, it's probably going to get into that gap as well. So make sure you draw that. We also have a fresh little resistance here at 446.50s. So this is a big rejection level, led to almost a 2% day right here into gap support. We had a big rejection off that on Friday, likely due to semis. Pretty sure it's guaranteed due to semis. If you look at this in Nvidia's chart, it's basically the same thing. But if you look at some of the other mega caps, it's not gonna make any sense to you. But if you look at the semis, like Nvidia, AMD, and then look at the QQQ, it's gonna make sense to you. I could even show you a chart on the SMH, which is the semiconductor ETF that I like to trade. It basically looks the same as Nvidia because Nvidia makes up 25% of it. So we can go over that next too as well. Even though they both look similar, they kind of do have a different kind of parabolicness to it. SMH is straight parabolic. Well. QQQ kind of just melts up. So arguably, I mean, semis is what's been bringing the QQQ up. Maybe a little bit of Meta and Microsoft as well, because we haven't really seen a big pullback in Microsoft or Meta, but we have seen pullbacks in Google and Apple. So I would say semis are probably carrying this the most. And that's why on Friday, once they finally pull back, we have a really, really big bearish engulfing bar taking out the previous lows and the highs of this previous bar on Thursday. For the moving averages, Still holding over your 9 and 21 combo, so you can't get too bearish yet. Every time we get into this area, bulls have showed up, tried to buy the dip. Only difference this time, you have a more clear reversal off this 446.50, so you might want to be a little bit more cautious trying to buy this dip. But maybe you could look at some scalps or something on day trades. I probably just wouldn't want to go long for like a swing or anything right here. Really even on the SPY or the QQQ, I really don't like swings up here need to see a little bit more of a better value area for me personally. But if you are pretty good at adding at higher lows and stuff like that, this is getting back to your short term value area. The 9 and 21 combo has worked wonders. Showed you on SPY and QQQ both. 
every time we get to the zone, it gets bought back up. So it's basically the same as buy. You don't want to go short until it breaks under your 9 of 21 combo. Also, your uptrend line maybe even once it gets inside the gap wait for that before trying to go for a put swing or anything like that but you are starting to get a little bit more evidence maybe that some type of pullback is coming with this 446.50 rejection obviously there's a lot of urgency to get out once it got up here and you even see that on the smh chart as well one thing you don't have on spy or qqq yet is a pretty much a close under the previous week low so we weren't able to close under this bar right here we weren't able to close under the lows, which doesn't signal a real reversal yet. Same with the SPY. Basically, just have a base out candle here. We briefly touched the lows of the previous week low, but until we start, you know, taking that out, so it's going to be 504.91 for the SPY this week, and also 433.65 for the QQQ this week. So we won't see any real reversal until we start closing under the one week lows, the previous one week lows. Make sure you mark those. That's kind of a basic way to look at reversals or kind of pay attention to structures. Your previous week low is really good to know when an actual reversal is coming and it'll kind of save you some money because if you're trying to go short when we haven't taken out the previous week lows yet you might get caught in a higher low and blast off higher and then you'll wish you didn't short but here's smh's chart it's very very bearish i would say just from this one bar i wouldn't say it's totally collapsed yet or anything it's pretty obvious that we needed some type of rejection a little bit of profit taking because it was getting a little bit ridiculous as you see by this chart if we go to the one week candles you can see we're kind of starting to look a little bit more uncertain here we have a big upper shadow wick this is not a bullish bar by any means obviously the market can you know defy expectations and it can still go higher even on this like i said needs to take out the previous week low it probably need to get under 218.29 for semis or this smh etf that as a whole if this whole sector goes down the qqq is going to go down as well so make sure you mark the previous week low for this upcoming trading week wait for that to get taken out before trying to go short or look for any big reversal in the market but i hope you see why the qqq went down so aggressively i mean just look at the smh this is a big move four percent on this etf nvidia went down five percent so we can look at the moving averages real quick we're still over the 9 to 21 combo the 9 to 21 combo has been pretty good for smh every time we get into it, it basically bounces bounce right here bounce right here bounce right here we also have a rally based rally demand zone so i mean dip buyers can still show up you got to be careful i would say once smh gets under this demand zone low which is also the previous week low by the way if it gets under this on this upcoming trading week that's a pretty good reversal signal and it could go lower you see nvidia go lower amd etc but otherwise this could act as a buyer's area for short term higher low at least maybe scalpers are trying to pick up calls on nvidia something like that and you'll see a short term bounce at least but that's really all i got definitely want to watch previous week low uh 433.65 if you can get down there that could even be a good scalp area for calls as well and then your resistance is very obvious this week 446.58 so make sure you're watching 446.58 to 433.65 for the nasdaq that's kind of your potential trading range right now and we are kind of getting wider atrs which makes sense we have a bigger fomc meeting coming up as well as cpi coming up this week so maybe that's why we were seeing that crazy volatility last week VIX really hasn't gone up too much, but as long as it stays over 15 on the VIX, we can definitely see some elevated volatility. Probably will need to get back over 20 overall for the VIX for any real volatility signal, but we are starting to see that widen a little bit. But hope you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our X Trades YouTube channel. I'm gonna go ahead and get this chopped up, sent out, all that good stuff. This time change is kind of messing with me, so I need to start working on the editing before it gets too late. Kind of am uh, starting a little bit later today, just due to the time change. But I love you guys. And I'm out. There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge.